calorimetry. In the previous video, we mentioned that there were three different types of reactions involving calorimetry. In this video, we're going to be focusing on neutralization. In neutralization, we take an acid and an alkali and mix them together in a beaker. This creates salt and water. And there's going to be some sort of temperature change involved as well. So if we want to work out the enthalpy change for this reaction, we have to first work out how much heat energy is released from the reaction. We can do this by using Q equals MC delta T. Then we have to divide it by the number of moles. Now, because we're doing neutralization, it's going to be divided by number of moles of water produced. This is different to combustion, where we divide it by number of moles of fuel. So neutralization divided by number of moles of water produced. Okay, let's do an example question. Here we're mixing hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide. And we're going to produce sodium chloride and water. This reaction is going to give off some heat. And the temperature change that we measured using our thermometer went from 20 degrees to 60 degrees. So, can we work out the enthalpy change of neutralization? Okay, to work out enthalpy change, the first thing we have to do is work out how much energy was released. So, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T. Now, the M stands for mass of solution. In this case, we have a 60 centimeter cubed solution in the polystyrene cup. 30 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid plus 30 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide. Now we know that one centimeter cubed of water has a mass of one gram. So if I have a 60 centimeter cubed solution, that means it's going to have a mass of 60 grams. Okay, we have M. Now C stands for the specific heat capacity of water. This is usually given to you in the question and it's around 4.18. Then we're going to times it by the temperature change. So that's from 20 to 60, which is 40. This gives us 10,032 joules. However, since we want this in kilojoules, we're going to divide by 1,000 and we're going to get the following value. Okay, so we've worked out how much energy has been released. Next, we need to divide this by the number of moles of water produced in this reaction. First, we're going to make sure our reaction is balanced. In this case, it's 1 to 1 to 1 to 1. You don't have to write the ones. Okay, so well, let's work out how many moles of reactants we have. To work out hydrochloric acid, we're going to do concentration times volume divided by 1000. And we're going to get 0 0.015. And we're going to get the same moles of sodium hydroxide. So that means the moles of water will also be 0 0.015. Because they all have a 1 to 1 ratio. Okay, now we have the moles of water. So energy divided by water is going to give us enthalpy change and it's going to be 668 kilojoules per mole. Don't forget to put a minus in front of it because this reaction was exothermic and we know that because the temperature went up. If it went down, then you just put a plus. Here's another question that could be asked regarding this topic. So it says here, a data book value for the enthalpy of reaction is minus 950. Our value, which was the experimental value, was minus 668 kilojoules per mole. So we can see that our value is much less exothermic or is smaller compared to the actual data book value. So how come it's smaller? One reason is that there is heat loss to the surroundings. So when the reaction occurred, heat was lost through the walls of the container. So to avoid that, we should insulate our containers. Also, using a polystyrene cup is a better material than using a glass cup or a glass beaker. Secondly, we can also place a lid on it to help better insulate the reaction. The second reason our value is less exothermic is because of problems in recording temperature change. Okay, now don't throw your thermometer away. The reaction on the thermometer said 20 to 60 which is fine. However, despite our best attempt to insulate it, there's always going to be heat loss. So 
if there was some magical way of preventing complete heat loss, so fully insulating the reaction, do you think the same reaction would go from 20 to 60, or perhaps would it go to an even higher temperature? If you think it will go to a higher temperature when we prevent heat loss, then you're correct. In order to get an accurate enthalpy change, we're going to have to plot a graph. So, the graph that we're going to have is going to say time on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis. So, when we do the experiment, first of all, we're going to get our beaker and then place one of the reactants, so let's say the acid, into the beaker. Now, before we mix in the alkali, we're going to take a thermometer and place it into the beaker which has only got acid at the moment. Then, for a while, we're just going to sit there and measure the temperature of the reaction. Then, every 30 seconds, we're simply going to measure the temperature of the solution. This is so that we can get a baseline temperature. Next, we're going to mix in the alkali. And then we can see the reaction will begin and the temperature will start to rise. Eventually, the reaction stops. However, we're still going to be measuring the temperature even after the reaction has stopped. Okay, once we have this graph, then we're going to make two lines of best fit. One over here for our baseline temperature, and then another one for the cooling part, or the part where it's sloping down. Then, from the moment that we added the alkali, so in this case two minutes, we're going to draw a line up and we're going to extrapolate it and we're going to see where it hits our second green line. From here, we're going to look at the y-axis. So this time, it shows that the temperature change was from 20 to 70. Now, what does this mean? Well, we know that the sloping down part of the line is telling us how much heat is being lost from the reaction. So we can use that rate of heat loss and simply add it back to our reaction. In other words, what we're doing here is showing what the temperature would have been had there been no heat loss. So that amount of heat loss that's occurring right now, we can see from the slope, we're just adding that back to our temperature. Okay, to summarize what we just did. Number one, we're going to record the temperature at regular intervals. Number two, we're going to plot a temperature versus time graph. Number three, then we're going to draw two lines of best fit. Number four, we're going to extrapolate the cooling back to the time of addition of the second reactant. Like so. Then, from the moment that we added the second reactant, we're going to draw a line up to our extrapolated line. And from this, we're going to establish the maximum theoretical temperature. So if they ever ask you in a question, how would you obtain a proper or true temperature change? This is what you'd mention. Okay, some final points on calculation mistakes on this particular topic. Now, instead of making a separate video, I'll just quickly explain it here. So number one, we know to work at enthalpy change, we're going to have to do energy divided by moles. In this case, for neutralization, it's going to be divided by moles of water produced. So, let's say we have this reaction. First of all, make sure it's balanced. Okay, if I have 0.05 moles of hydrochloric acid and 0.05 moles of potassium hydroxide, because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, I'm going to produce the same amount of moles of water, and this will go into the equation. However, let's say I have 0.03 moles of hydrochloric acid and 0.05 moles of potassium hydroxide. Now we can see that one of the reactants are limiting, and we use the limiting reactant when we work out the moles of water. So in this case, we're going to have 0.03 moles of water, and that's going to go in the equation. Now I've made a separate video on limiting reactants for GCSEs. However, I know that A-levels are very demanding, so instead of making you watch that video, I'll just do one final example. In this reaction, we have sulfuric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide. Now, the first thing we have to do is balance it. Okay, now that it's balanced, let's say I have 0.04 moles of sulfuric acid 
and 0.05 moles of sodium hydroxide. Now you might be tempted to say, oh easy, that's a limiting reactant, so that means I'm going to have 0.04 moles of water. However, that won't be correct in this case. The reason is because the reaction is a 1 to 2 with sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to first divide my moles of sodium hydroxide by 2, which gives me 0.025. As for the sulfuric acid, I'm going to leave it as 0.04 because there's a 1 in front of it. Now when I look at these two, we can see that overall sodium hydroxide is lower. So I'm going to times that by 2 because there's a 2 in front of water and that means I get 0.05 moles of water. And that goes there. So I hope that helped. If you want to go over limiting reactants, there's another video on GCSEs, you can watch that. Hey guys, if that video helped you, support our channel by liking, subscribing and sharing it with your friends. And more importantly, if you still have questions, drop a post on our forum at examqa.com where I will personally be there to help answer your questions. Mohammed signing out.